will talk about critical care in pregnancy. Our topic will be covering this heading. Take a second. Not much background noise. Sir. So uh, we will be covering uh, most of the critical illnesses in pregnancy. That will be perimortem, um, perimortem cesarean section, infection, ARDS, shock, embolism, how to protect and electrolytes, how to set up a HDO and ICU. So, what is a critical illness? So, anything that is leading to significant organ dysfunction, maybe it may be impending, developing, or fully established, and that significant organ dysfunction which ultimately lead to significant morbidity and mortality to the obstetric patient so uh, and why is it so different critical illness in a obstetric patient because there are physiological changes so so many physiological changes in pregnancy per se fetus well-being also needs to be considered so that is why it is a unique challenge prevalence is very high almost 100 to 900 per 1 lakh pregnancies and 50% uh, of ICU admissions are because of these two conditions mainly one is hypertensive disease, which includes all preeclampsia, eclampsia patients, and second is hemorrhage. So hemorrhage can be antepartum hemorrhage, can be postpartum hemorrhage. Okay. Then uh, maternal mortality due to critical illness is very high. It is almost 12 to 20 percent, which is very high. So any patient in obstetrics developing any of the critical illness mortality is one out of five patients. So successful maternal and neonatal outcomes are largely dependent on multidisciplinary management, which includes physician, anesthetist, obstetrician, neonatologist, and critical care specialist, and blood bank specialist as well. So there are different different levels of critical care. So one is level zero care, which is normal ward care, which you already know. Level one care is all those patients who are at risk of deterioration and need close observation. So Close watch need to be uh, given to those patients. Close monitoring needs to be given. So all those patients who we are keeping under observation at close observation, hourly or maybe half hourly observation, so comes under level one care. So level two care is HDU care. So they need some sort of invasive monitoring along with support and support of single organ is required. In that condition, we say HDU monitoring is required. But it should not be respiratory organ failure. So whenever respiratory organ system failure is there, patient needs to be shifted to ICU, not HDO. So if a patient has requirement of ventilator and all this thing or bag and mask ventilation or CPAP and all this, so ICU care is required, not HDU care. So single organ failure, not a respiratory organ failure per se, HDU. Can, uh, a patient can be managed in HDU, but if there is uh, other sort of uh, other organ failure or respiratory organ failure along with that, then ICU management is required. So different different causes of critical illness, all of this you know, but some of these causes are specific to pregnancy. Some are getting exacerbated by pregnancy itself, like heart disease, valvular heart disease, congenital heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, chronic kidney disease. And there are some conditions who have increased susceptibility in pregnancy like sepsis, venous thromboembolism, aspiration syndrome. And some are completely unrelated like diabetic ketoacidosis, pneumonia, bronchial asthma and all. So some are particularly specific to pregnancy which is very important. Preeclampsia, eclampsia, obstetric hemorrhage, acute fatty liver of pregnancy and then amniotic fluid embolism. So these are certain changes in pregnancy which are occurring and which ultimately impact maternal recirculation as well. So if you look at plasma volume, it is increasing by 40, 40, 45%, 50%. Heart rate is also increasing. Cardiac output is also increasing. So all of these ultimately lead to increase in the demand of CPR. Recirculation. So whenever patient is critically ill or CPR requirement is there, so everything will be increased because the oxygen carrying capacity of blood per se in pregnancy is decreased. Plasma volume is increasing, RBC volume is increasing, but the ratio is not proportionate. 
So plasma volume increases by 45 to 50 percent. RBC volume increases by almost 25 percent. So there is development of physiological anemia, and this physiological anemia of pregnancy ultimately, per se, like 100 ml of uh, blood will have decreased oxygen carrying capacity as compared to a non-pregnant patient. Then uh, uterine blood flow is also getting increased. So there is a risk of massive hemorrhage. Systemic vascular resistance is also decreased. Venous return is also getting decreased. Let us come to respiratory system. So respiratory rate gets increased, and which will lead to more chances of acidosis. Oxygen consumption is increasing by 20%. Laryngeal edema makes difficult intubation. Gastric motility is decreased, so that's why chances of aspiration is increased. Lower esophageal sphincter is relaxed, so again the chances of uh, aspiration while intubation to a pregnant patient gets increased. Uterus is so it pushes, uh, makes the uh, difficult elevation. So hemodynamic and cardiac monitoring in obstetric patients, what all needs to be monitored and how it needs to be monitored, how frequently it needs to be monitored is also very important. So there are some non-invasive and then invasive monitoring systems are available to us. Whenever we talk about non-invasive methods, ECG, pulse oximeter, pulse rate, and then blood pressure monitoring is very important and very commonly available. Other than that, there, there are some blood investigations available like serum lactate. Serum lactate is a very important monitor for tissue perfusion. And ultimately, tissue perfusion reflects tissue oxygenation. So if serum lactate is increased, it says tissue perfusion is low. It says tissue oxygenation is poor. Then comes the serum electrolyte levels. Then comes the ABG. Yes, ABG assessment. At least you should know how to roughly assess ABG. The ABG is very vast topic in itself, but you should know what kind of acidosis is it? Is it respiratory? Is it metabolic acidosis? Is it uh, alkalosis? If it is alkalosis, then what kind of alkalosis it is? Respiratory or metabolic? And what needs to be corrected? when bicarbonate needs to be supplemented, when calcium needs to be supplemented. So all this you need to understand at basic level. So normal pH level, whenever you are reading a ABG report, you should see that it is in between 7.35 to 7.45. So anything less than 7.35, it is acidosis. Anything more than 7.45, it is alkalosis. You should always look at the PaCO2 level. So the normal range of PaCO2 is between 30 45. So you should always look at the uh, level of PaCO2 and PaO2 level if it is more than 100 mm of Hg, bicarbonate level normally it is between 20 to 28. So what is limitation of uh, SpO2, SpO2 monitoring? So it can be altered whenever there is hypothermia, hypovolemia and peripheral vascular disease uh, is there if inflated proximal BP cuff is there. So about ABG interpretation, so acidosis and alkalosis you can clearly make out. And when do we say respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis? So in metabolic alkalosis or acidosis, bicarbonate value will be altered. And whenever there is respiratory condition is there, PaCO2 value will be altered. So if bicarbonate level is high, that is metabolic alkalosis. If bicarbonate level is low, this is metabolic acidosis. In respiratory condition, what will happen? PaCO2, if it increases, PaCO2 increases, that means there will be retention of CO2 and this returns to acidosis. Okay. And if this PaCO2 level is decreased, Okay, and again, this anion gap is also very important. So regarding CPR, cardiac arrest in pregnancy is uh, very rare. It is almost one in uh, 30,000 births. And uh, maternal collapse, you already know that any acute event involving the cardiorespiratory system failure or brain leading to reduced or absent conscious levels, potentially death at any stage in pregnancy up to six weeks. So that is called maternal collapse. So what should be done 
for CPR. So there should be a pre-event planning. So what do you mean by pre-event planning? If there is a maternal arrest, there cannot be a planned pre-event -pre planning. But you should always be prepared. You should always have something in mind that if something like this happens, what all things you need to do. So this pre-event planning means you should be clear in your mind what all things to be done. Then early recognition. So whenever you face such sort of patient, there should be early recognition of symptoms, early recognition of uh, such condition and early uh, starting of CPR should be there. Basic life support and advanced life support. Uh, this we will discuss in detail. And then there is perimortem cesarean delivery, how it, sh uh, it should be done and immediate post arrest care. So what is basic life support protocol? So whenever a patient is unresponsive, there is no breathing, no normal breathing. You should always activate emergency response system and uh, minimum this three additional staff crash card, your crash card should be ready. So this is pre event planning. Your crash card should be ready. Your laryngoscope should be ready. Your drugs should be available. So all this should be available. Your uh, automated external defibrillator should be charged and available. So this is pre event planning. So whenever uh, such sort of condition occurs, you should always check pulse, definite pulse within 10 seconds, whether it is there or not. If it is not there, then you should immediately start chest compressions. If there is definite pulse available, then you should start it along with the bag and mask. So if pulse is available, then start bag and mask with chest compression. If pulse is not there, then start chest compression only in the beginning. The most important thing, why do we? compression in a pregnant patient. So there should be a firm blackboard. This patient in supine condition. Place hands in center of the chest as a non-pregnant patient. And compression should be at the rate of 100 per minute. And depth should be at least 2 inches. Allow for complete chest recoil after each compression. Minimize, uh, minimize interruptions. And perform continuous maternal manual left uterine displacement. This is very important. So as you can see in the picture that this mother is at certain level which is almost 25 to 30 degree level from the floor. So this should be there. So partial tilt and then manual displacement of the uterus should be there. So any of these two you can do. So either displacement of uterus or left lateral tilt. Uh, and what will be its impact? So it will prevent compression of vena cava. So this manual uterine displacement can be done by two hand technique, can be done by one hand technique and can be done by a lateral wedge which gives you 30 degree lateral tilt. In the basic life support protocol, so there is airway management. So, so you all of you should know how to integrate a patient in certain emergencies you might not get anesthesiologist or physician available to intubate such patients but whenever it is required you should be prepared to intubate these patients so uh, or at least manage airway so sir, management of airway is not just intubation it includes uh, bag and mask ventilation and uh, make, make, making sure that there is patent airway so for that chin lift and jaw thrust which is very important maneuver so your chin should be tilted lifted jaw should be thrust up anteriorly so this is as seen in the picture this is a very important maneuver so it makes sure that the mouth opening is in clear connection with the trachea then after that uh, delivery of oxygen at the rate of 15 liter per minute should be ensured when available perform bag and mask ventilation two breaths for every 30 compressions each hour one second enough volume to produce visible chest rise if not seen, reopen airway and readjust mask. In the meantime, you should apply automated external defibrillator and if 12 lead ECG is available, that should be applied at the same time. So what you will get an idea that if there is any cardiac arrhythmia or uh, arrhythmia is there, then this defibrillator can be used. So this is uh, the rate of shockable and non-shockable rhythm. So yes, this is very important. What is CABU? 
so c is circulation a is airway b is breathing so circulation you are ensuring by chest compressions airway ensuring is by chin lift jaw thrust head tilt and then breathing and u is uterine displacement so this is very important in obstetric patients cabu now let us come to advanced life support it is provided by maternal cardiac arrest team which consists of adult resuscitation team made by critical care physicians and nursing obstetrician neonatologist anesthesiologist and what is the main aim main aim is to correct the etiology so any of these etiology is there we should focus on that etiology hypovolemia hypoxemia acidosis hypothermia causing uh, uh, and uh, all the four Ds, tamponade, tension, pneumothorax, thrombus. So this cause needs to be identified in advanced life support. Then second is establish airway, establish IV access and administer drugs. So establish airway, what do you mean by establish airway? You cannot do chest compression all the time. So you need to put patient on ventilator. You need to secure airway by putting endotracheal tube or uh, LMA tube. So this establishment of airway in advanced life support is ensuring LMA or endotracheal tube placement. Establish IV access. So in the beginning, whenever patient is pulseless, you might not be able to insert IV access. So in the basic life support, IV access is not the part of basic life supports. But in advanced life support, we need to ensure that IV access is uh, made sure and drugs are administered. Prepare for perimortem yeah. cesarean delivery. So whenever, uh, when do we need to go for perimortem cesarean delivery? That we will discuss. Okay. So, uh, maternal interventions require LMA placement, endotracheal tube placement, oxygen delivery, IV access or intros access, fluid bolus if hypothalamia is, uh, hypovolemia is there. Uh, if it is shockable condition, then adrenaline or amiodarone should be started. If it is non-shockable, then only adrenaline should be given. And uh, obstetric interventions, continuous manual left uterine displacement. Detached fetal monitors prepare for emergency cesarean delivery. Now this is very important. If there is no return of spontaneous circulation by four minutes of your CPR, immediate cesarean delivery should be done in such patients. This time is very important, four minutes. But otherwise, uh, you will not be able to prevent baby from significant injury. This injury can be hypoxic injury to baby or baby might have a stigma. So, and at the same time, neonatal team should be available to immediate resuscitation of the baby. So, this for what should be done for this perimortem cesarean delivery? It is defined as birth of fetus after maternal cardiac arrest, mostly during resuscitation period. It has dual benefit. First, it relieves aortocaval compression. Second, delivery of fetus with increased <coughs> risk of anoxia induced neurotonical damage. So, one, you are preventing baby fetus. Second, you are improving CPR maneuvers by decreasing aortocaval com uh, compression by uterus itself. By the time of perimortem cesarean delivery, reversible causes should be ruled out. To be considered regardless of viability in gravid uterus more than 20 weeks if no return of spontaneous circulation is there. So, whenever uterus size is increased, it should be considered not just to prevent baby, it should be done to prevent mother as well and timing of PMCD is again four minutes is uh, you should remember always four minutes so uh, survival of mother reported with PMCD done up to 15 minutes after onset of arrest neonatal survival reported even after uh, when delivery occurred up to 25 minutes if maternal viability is not possible start PMCD immediately so how it should be done what is required for PMCD? A single instrument that is sufficient is a scalpel. With a single scalpel, you can do PMCD. But these are certain instruments that should be available. It is performed at the site of resuscitation. Patients need not to be shifted to OT or uh, for uh, PMCD. Shifting leads to waste of time and reduces CPR quality. Fetal monitors should be detached immediately. Antiseptic solution should be poured over abdomen. Only equipment needed to start to start is scalpel. Vertical versus penisty, it is fully dependent on surgeon's discretion. If ROSC, 
is there antibiotics and oxytocin should be kept ready oxytocin may cause arrest so it should be used with caution when will left uterine displacement need to be continued during pmcd as well so these are certain instruments that should be there but to be frank only scalpel is sufficient rest can be arranged later on yes perimortem cesarean uh, delivery consent is not required it is a emergency condition so if relatives are not agreeing that doesn't mean that you should not be doing pmcd because time is everything in pmcd immediate post arrest care if still pregnant patient placed in left lateral position do manual left uterine displacement continuous electronic fetal monitoring as soon as rosc is there return of spontaneous circulation sensitive indicators of maternal uh, status decision for emergency lscs and uh, check electrolytes abg ecg rbs shift patient to icu reevaluate oxygenation and ventilation temperature control is very important therapeutic hypothermia does help whenever there is neurological injury suspected examination for sedation related injuries should be done debrief the family about whatever cpr or everything has been done and whatever uh, prognosis is there for both mother and baby and evaluate cause of maternal collapse or illness infection prevention and control in hdu or icu so how that needs to be done optimum space per bed is almost 120 to 150 square per feet so it should not be congested environment protection negative pressure isolation rooms what do you mean by negative pressure isolation room so infected air is removed by negative pressure so air needs to be going in as well as going out positive pressure isolation rooms positive pressure prevents outside air from entering for patients at high risk of infection so waste disposal all of you know hand hygiene all of you know prophylactic antibiotics yes, this is very important so for cesarean all of this you know that uh, first generation cephalosporin is the drug of choice but nowadays we are preferring third generation cephalosporin it should be administered 15 to 16 minutes before incision this time is very important it should not be like one or two hour prior uh, to incision it should not be delayed whenever there is more than uh three hours of surgery like sometimes whenever there is obstetric hysterectomy or intraoperative delay is there so in those cases we need to repeat the dose and whenever there is more than 1.5 liter of blood loss we need to repeat the dose let us talk about sepsis syndrome so a life threatening organ dysfunction due to infection and dysregulated response of host to that infection the estimated death is almost 2.6 lakh per year and again it contributes to in developing countries so these are certain terminologies which is very important so sir is that is systemic inflammatory response syndrome sepsis severe sepsis and septic shock so sirs is either temperature raised or hypothermia heart rate more than 90 per minute respiratory rate more than 20 per minute or pcu to less than 32 wbc if there is leukocytosis or leukopenia any two of these four that is sir systemic inflammatory response syndrome sepsis is whenever there is documented or suspected infection along with these parameters then you call it sepsis severe sepsis is whenever there is organ dysfunction associated with it and this organ dysfunction can be assessed by all these parameters so tissue perfusion lactate level urine output renal function creatinine again renal function bilirubin level liver function platelet count hematological function coagulopathy again hematological function so severe sepsis is whenever there is organ dysfunction along with sepsis in septic shock means whenever along with any of these there is hypotension and hypoperfusion that is called septic shock so these are certain red flag signs for underlying sepsis fever tachycardia or uh, tachypnea abdominal or chest pain diarrhea vomiting spontaneous rupture of membrane significant vaginal discharge uterine or renal angle tend for phyllonephritis and look is also again very important toxic look many a time we have seen that patient uh, 
uh, with sepsis do have toxic load. Breast engorgement for any mastitis, rash, wound infection, and uh, foul smelling vaginal discharge for chorea in patients with chorea urinary symptoms again because of UT and paranephritis, delay in uterine inhalation seen in endometritis patients. So these are the risk factors, organism, and these are the causes which uh, increases the chances of sepsis and septic shock. Okay, how do you manage sepsis? So management of sepsis needs to be very prompt. So first is recognition. So whenever you are suspecting, so there should be some of the risk factors which prompt you that to suspect that it is because of sepsis. And there is your resuscitation and treatment including early antibiotics, source control and early review by senior doctors. Okay. So early recognition. So there are certain scoring systems, but whenever you are in practice, you don't follow this scoring system very thoroughly. But you need to know this that there is MIOX score, SOS score, SOFI score, QSOFI score, which indicates that there is an ongoing sepsis condition. So uh, just to tell you in brief about SOFI score, that is sequential organ failure score. It considers respiratory system, hepatic system, renal system, hematological system, cardiovascular system and neurological system. So for hematological system, there is platelet count. For hepatic, again, bilirubin is there, cardiovascular, hypotension is there, neurological system, Glasgow coma scale is there. And for renal function, creatinine level is monitored. And for respiratory system, PaO2 by FiO2 ratio is monitored. So based on the score, if higher the SOFI score is there, higher the chances of mortality. And quick SOFI score is, to, is a tool to assess bedside the outcome of patient. If this score is two or more, there is high chances of ICU stay, prolonged ICU stay and death. So uh, there are three criteria, low blood pressure, high respiratory rate, altered medication. Now this is Glasgow Coma School. All of you must have read this in uh, this. So EVM, eye response, verbal response, and motor response is there. So eye response again carries four score and four points. Verbal response five points. Motor response six points. So based on this, and there is no zero point for any of these. So minimum is three, maximum is fifteen. So fifteen is fully conscious, alert, and uh, motor response patient. Entry is completely bended patient with severe brain injury. Okay, so uh, coming back to sepsis management, there should be prompt administration of empirical antibiotics. But before you are giving antibiotics, you should take proper samples. What do you mean by proper sample? If you are suspecting wound infection, take wound swab. If you are suspecting chorioamnionitis, take high vaginal swab. If you are suspecting blood infection, then take blood culture. If you are suspecting pyelonephritis or UTI, take urine culture. Okay, so this need to be individualized in all this patient. And then after taking appropriate sample, you administer an empirical antibiotics. So empirical antibiotics, what do you want to cover? Most of the time it is gram positive cocci or anaerobic infection. So gram positive cover should be there, anaerobic cover should be there. These two are very important. Broad spectrum antibiotics generally cover both gram positive and gram negative. So there are some of the drugs which acts against uh, anaerobes that is metronidazole, clenidazole, secundazole and uh, again clendamycin. Okay. So these drugs acts against anaerobes. Then there are certain drugs which against are broad spectrum antibiotics like amikacin is broad spectrum antibiotic, gentamicin is a broad spectrum antibiotic. Some which against acts against both gram positive and gram negative, like third generation cephalosporin. Okay. Ampicillin class of drug they mostly acts against gram positive only. And whenever there is allergy suspected to penicillin class of drugs, then erythromycin or clethromycin needs to be replaced. And whenever you are going for higher antibiotic, piperacillin, tazobactam, meropenem, linezolate, all this needs to be used. But initially, you should go with the third generation cephalosporin along with anaerobic. Now, what do you mean by source control? 
so if there is already a focus of infection is there then you need to control that infection otherwise it will keep on coming back so whenever there is chorioamnionitis they may need to be delivered as soon as possible whenever there is rpoc it needs to be evacuated whenever there is bladder, uh, bowel injury laparotomy and resection anastomosis it needs to be done as soon as possible incomplete abortion again surgical or medical evacuation needs to be done breast abscess ind needs to be done along with that what supportive care needs to be done so in sepsis there is hypoperfusion so fluid correction is very important blood sugar level management is very important dvt profile exercise